Good morning, everyone. We want to thank God for the trip to Mocha. Uh, we have this opportunity to work with the Sarawak Baptist Church, and uh, they are actually doing quite a good job among the longhouses and even reaching out to the minorities. Actually, not minorities, the indigenous. I think the Chinese are the minorities. <laughs> Iban, Iban, Iban is the majority. Yeah. So they are they are the indigenous uh, people group. Uh. So we have gone to Bidayu, uh, go gone to the Iban and also to visit the Bidayu people. Basically, just now we have saw the longhouse. This is not the longhouse that we visit because they told us we are not allowed to take pictures and post it. So this is what I have captured from the website one of the sharing people are talking about the long houses these are the more modern long houses and as you can see the long houses have very long and big and wide like a hallway and uh, sometimes they will sleep there they will do all the activities there so our lunch and dinner they also have it there but yeah, yeah but they they are their house after the door you know every unit uh, after the door they have another big I think the living room is as big as this hall, oh, the living room. Then behind the living room, there's another two or three rooms, depending on how, how they design. And then there's a kitchen. Usually there's a kitchen and a toilet behind. So it's a very big place. Uh, if they know how to use it, I, to me, I felt that they can even make use of this to turn it into a mobile or even uh, impromptu uh, kindergarten or childcare place. Uh. But because it belongs to every area belongs to the unit. So it depends whether they want to col collaborate to do that. But I think uh, if they are looking at it, they have they already have very good place to, to work with to start off. Uh, so but of, of course they will need teachers who are qualified to do that. Lah. So I think we have we have uh, also visited three long houses total. Uh, then we have visited a couple of churches. We also witnessed one guy during the night service, worship service. Uh, this pastor Leslie actually went through different longhouses every day, almost every day, I think, to different longhouses to conduct worship services, to talk to them, to share with them. So one of the night that we visited, one of the guys actually wanted to receive Christ. So they prayed and received Christ. These people, uh, I see them, they, they may not be very well educated. They may not even know the Bible a lot. But the longhouses that we visited, most of them actually are Christian. Basically, the head, house, head of the house are, are Christian. So, uh, but they really have very simple faith in God. They just trust God. Uh, the last night that we went for the longhouse, where the guy actually prayed, uh, after the service, wow, they... They, they asked us to actually pray for their illness. A lot of them have some illness. So, yeah, my, my experience with them is they have very simple favor. But they need to grow in the word of God. And, uh, but I, I believe they will grow if we have people who can teach them properly. So with this backdrop, I think I would like to take this opportunity to, to divert a little bit away from my normal sharing to talk to the church about passion to God passion to the Lord, passion for the lost. Okay, let us pray before we go further. Lord, we want to thank you for the trip that we have made last week to Sarawak. We know you love us. We also know that you love the people in Sarawak. We thank you also for those who have come to know you through the ministry of the Sarawak Church. And we do want to pray for them that you continue to uh, strengthen their faith so that Lord, uh, no matter what happens in the future, they will continue in their faith in you. We also pray for those who have come to know you that Lord, they will also become the light and salt to their own people in the areas. We pray for the kindergarten that we are going to uh, involve in. We pray that it will also be a good point of contact with other longhouses. So that Lord, uh, Pastor Leslie and the team can really reach out to them. Lord, we also pray for ourselves. Lord, as we come together, we pray that today as we listen to your word, we ask that you will touch our hearts, to challenge us, 
and to help us, Lord, to really be able to focus on you and your, the task that you have given to us. So we want to thank you. We commit this time to you. We ask for your spirit to lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think when we talk about the passion for the Lord, we need to go back to what Jesus says, especially about the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment? Just now we have read from Matthew, when the Pharisees or, or the, the, the teachers of the law come and ask Jesus about this. He actually gives them an answer. Now I want to share with you another version of it or another instance of it. That's taken from Mark chapter 12 verse 28 to 31. If you can turn to the Bible or you can read from the screen. It says, And one of the scribes came up and listened and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, ask him, that's Jesus, which command, commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandments greater than this. So reading from this verse, we know that the very basis of our, our passion for God have to start from our declaration of our allegiance to God. This is taken from Deuteronomy 4, uh, 6, 4 and 5. Here it says, actually, Moses given to the uh, Israelites. At the, at the when they came up from Egypt uh, yeah came up from Egypt it says here O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one this is the Shema I think we have talked about this uh, previously this is Shema that normally the the men will pray almost every day about this they are declaring their allegiance to God they are declaring that God is the only one the only one true God that they are believing in then we know that when we have declare our allegiance to God, what follows is very important. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So we have to, we have to know that God actually command us when we have pledged our allegiance to him, command us to love him with our whole being with all our strength, with all our might. And this command must be obeyed. Okay? And we need to cultivate this relationship to love Him. And if we want to love God, we actually have to learn also to obey Him, to know what He likes, what He don't like, what He is passionate about. Okay? In John, John 15, 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. To love God is to obey His commandments. To grow in our passion to love Him, we must also learn about what God is passionate about. Just like when you, you know, fall in love with somebody, you love someone, you would like to find out what this person would like, what this person dislike, so that you will do everything trying to please the person to show your love. You buy the best thing for her or him, you'll, you'll get what she wants or what he wants. So when we come to this point, we want to ask the question, how do we know what is God passionate about? Okay, how do we know God is what is God passionate about? I want to suggest three things that God is passionate about or what Jesus is passionate about. First, God wants us to know Him. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah 29, it says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let, let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and know me. That I am the Lord who practice." Practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness 
in the earth. So we can see here, God tells us that he does not want us to boast about our riches or what we can do, even what we can do for him. But he wants us to boast about how much we know him, that we understand him, that we know that he is a steadfast uh, a God with steadfastness, a God who practice justice, a God who desire righteousness. So if we know God, the more we know God, the more we can love God. How can we know God? Of course, we know that we have to go know God through His Word. We need to spend time on His Word to get to know Him. Another verse. Jesus in John 17, He begins with this. He said when He spoke, these words, he, he lift up his eyes to heaven and pray and say, Father, the, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given. That means God has given him eternal life to give to those who God has given him. And then he defined what is eternal life. And this is eternal life that they may that they know you the only through God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So the purpose of God giving us eternal life is to know him, to know him the only true God, that Jesus is the one that God has sent. So, yeah, one thing God is passionate about is he is always getting us attention to know him, to want us to know him. Second one I want to suggest that he is passionate about seeking and saving the lost. That is what God is always passionate about. He's always passionate about seeking and saving the lost. In Mark 10 45, this is one very crucial and important statement that Jesus has made. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said he is not here. To be served by people okay when he came to earth having a love uh, earthly life he said he came here to give his life as a ransom for many and then for even the son of man came for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost in luke 19 10. we know from these two verse that Jesus came to give his life, not only a ransom, okay, he also want to come to save them from, the, from their sins. Men have been fallen into sin and man has been condemned for eternity due to their sin. But Jesus says he came to give his life as a ransom so that the lost can be saved. So he desires to seek the lost, he desires to save the lost. Thirdly, he also desires to send laborers into the harvest field. And we know the very famous incidents where he says this. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel to the king the gospel of the kingdom and healing every diseases and every affliction. When he sees the crowds that is gathering around him, he had compassion for them because they were harassed. And helpless like sheep without the shepherd then he turned and said to his disciples the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field indeed the harvest is plentiful as we even go to uh, Sarawak we see many of the people are not safe many of the even like what she was saying, some of the longhouses even refuses to let the Christians to go into that to help them. So the harvest is plentiful. We look around us, we see many people do not believe in Jesus, even in Singapore. And many of our relatives, our parents are also non-believers. And many are living in their sins. We look around the world, the sin is doing a lot of work. There are so many things that is so sinful and is even affecting our, us ourselves and is tempting us every day. So it is Jesus' desire to bring the sinners into his kingdom, to know him, 
and to give deliverance for them away from their punishment of their sins. So, knowing God's passion for the lost, we must also develop this passion for the lost if we want to have a passion for the Lord. Uh, passion for the Lord, we must develop a passion also for the lost because that's what God desires. So for that, it brings us to from the greatest commandment to the great commission. What does the great commission say? Jesus says before the ascension, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, to observe all, I, all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is what Jesus said and commanded the disciples. Here he is sending out his laborers into the harvest field, want them to go and make disciples, want them to teach them, to baptize them, to teach them all that they have learned from Jesus, teaching them to know Jesus. And the promise is God will always be with us, even to the end of the age. Another last word of Jesus before he was taken to heaven, recorded by Luke in Acts 1.8. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We know the last word of a person is very important. Usually we like to honor the last word of the person. Here Jesus, before he was taken to heaven, he left behind these two important commandments or uh, instruction. Okay, One is to go into the world to to make disciples, to bring, make people believing in Christ, bring people to live the life that God wants us to live. By teaching them, baptizing them, teaching them, and training them to be the disciples and to be the laborers for the harvest. And not only that, you have to, in the, in the next statement, he says, you will receive power, you have to depend on the Holy Spirit and to become his witness for the rest of the world. You have to go out to the rest of the world. So Jesus wants us to go to the world, go to the end of the earth, and to be his witness, and to make him known, and to teach him, teach them to obey uh, all that he has commanded us. Okay? I believe it's God's desire for all of us to continue to grow in knowing God, to have a passion for God, and to if when we grow in our passion for God, we shall also need to grow in our passion for the lost. We must adopt this same passion that Jesus had, okay? Making it the life purpose, just as he did. He came, he made it a life purpose that he wanted to seek the lost, to minister to the lost, and to bring the lost into the kingdom of God. So we need to learn to bring the gospel to the unrich people. It can be in our midst, it can be in other countries. Now, I want us to think about this question. Okay, Do you know, since Jesus gave this great commandment, uh, great commission, not great commandments, when, since Jesus gave this great commission, almost 2,000 years have passed. Right? It has been almost 2,000 years. By the year 2000, let's say if, if it is true, our calendar is accurate. Lah. Jesus have taken, uh, have crucified, was crucified and was taken to heaven in the year AD, 2000, uh, AD 33. Then in the year 2000 and 2033, 2033, it will be the anniversary for the 2000 anniversary for the give, passing of the great commandment to Great commission to the disciples, to the church, to reach the world. So it's a 2000 anniversary by the year 2033. So let us consider why is it for 2000 years we are still not able to fully fulfill 
the Great Commission. Why is it that we are not able to fulfill the Great Commission? Of course, we know there are many, many reasons. There are many, many reasons. But as I, as we think about this, let me share with you one parable. It's called the parable of the life saving station. This day, this uh, parable was credited to Dr. Tidio O. Widiel. Okay. He was an Episcopal uh, pastor, and then he had penned this in 1953. At one point, nobody knows who wrote this, but somehow, some later, someone actually found out that he was the one who penned this. So let me share with you this uh, story. It says, on a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat. But a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. And with no thought for themselves or their safety, they went out day and night. Tirelessly, tirelessly, uh, tirelessly searching for the lost, many lives were saved by this wonderful little life-saving station. So it became famous. Some of them, some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with this station and give, their time, give of their time and money and effort to support its work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained. And the little life-saving station Rule. Some of the members of the life saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those who saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots and beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now, the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they decorated it beautifully and furnished it acquisitively because they used it as a sort of a crop. Fewer members were now interested in going to the sea on life-saving missions. So they hired lifeboat crews to do that job, professionals. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the crop, in the crop's decoration, and there was a liturgical lifeboat in the in the room where the crop initiation were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the off the coast, and the hired crews brought in loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and the beautiful new crop was considerably messed up. So the property, property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where the victims of the shipwrecks could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted, us, wanted to stop the life-saving activities altogether because it was unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insist upon life-saving as their primary purpose. They remember what they are set up for. They pointed out they were, they were still caught a life-saving station but they were finally voted down and told if they wanted to save lives of various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast, which they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that occurred in the old. It evolved into a club and yet another life-saving station was founded. 
And the history continue to repeat itself. And if you visit the coast today, you will find a number of exclusive crops along the coast, along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those areas. Only now, most of the people drown. This is the end of the story. It somehow does reflect and describe certain aspect of the church. Basically, this is also a parable of the church. It is easy for a church to deviate and became preoccupied with our own comfort, even become indifferent and apathetic, self-centered. I hope our church will not end up like that. So that could be one reason why, why the Great Commission after 2000 years it is still not completed. Even by the time 2033, if we continue with this mentality, same as the members of the life saving station, we will not be able to complete the Great Commission. So I hope we can finish well, all of us. We will not end up like the members of the uh, life saving station. So that when we meet our Lord, actually this is one, one of the lessons I learned when I was a young Christian, maybe the first camp, first camp that uh, I attended. This is one of the message. We want to hear from the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let us not, not forget what God has called us to do. To know Him and to reach out to the lost. I'd like to suggest two simple uh, thoughts or for application. First is to grow in our passion for the Lord, we need to become His disciples and to spend time with Him through His Word, to know Him, to show His love as we experience His love. That means we want to show our love to others as we experience the love from God. That's the first step. Second step, to grow in our passion for the lost, we must be willing to be His witness and always prepare ourselves to be ready to be sent to reach the lost, be it locally or in overseas. Let's not forget our church motto. I call it our church motto. To be Christ's disciples and to make disciples for Christ. Let's not forget that. Let's pray. Lord, we want to grow in our love for you. We want to grow in our passion for the lost. Help us to be a laborer, always prepared to be involved in the harvest field. As we seek to reach out to the lost, help us also Lord, to know that we are not doing it for ourselves, but doing it for you. Help us start from where we are to share Christ to those who are lost, and maybe we are able to continue to bring into our midst those who will turn to you for salvation. Help us in our hearts to honor Christ as Lord, as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that we is in us. Help us to do it with gentleness and with respect. May you be glorified in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.